record and get going. Hi and welcome. I am Sarah Grace Moore, president of Impact 100 and on the call with me today from Impact 100 is Kathy Thornton, our keeper of all things grant related. Uh, thanks for being here and Jen Williams, our fantastic um, administrative assistant who we could not do this work without. Uh, so that's the Impact 100 team on the call right now. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome you here for our Q&A session on our letter of intent process and just tell you very quickly about who we are and what we're trying to do here. So um, let me move my notes over. Sounds important to me. Our mission here at Impact 100 is to empower women to dramatically improve lives by collectively funding significant grants that make a lasting impact on our community. Since our inception in 2001, so 2021 will be our 20th year, we've awarded over $5 million to the local nonprofits uh, in our community for a total of 51 projects, transformational projects of at least $100,000, which is pretty amazing. Uh, at least I think it's pretty amazing. Um, how it works is that women join us every year at either a $500 or $1,000 level. Um, the entirety of that membership fee goes into the grant pool. So we pool all those monies into a, uh, a pool and they are split evenly um, into grants of at least $100,000. So this year, we had 541 members uh, for a total grant pool of 468,000. And so we gave, we did not give away, we awarded four grants of $100,000 this year. Um, so then local nonprofits are asked to submit a grant application within one of our five focus areas. So our five focus areas are family, health and wellness, education, culture, and environment recreation and preservation. Um, and so you can see that they are very broad and they're very broad for a reason because um, what we are trying to create transformation and there are lots of ways that we can create transformation in our community. So then our members come together to review the grant applications, perform financial analysis, uh, do site visits, and then ultimately select the grant finalists. And then in September, Usually at our annual award celebration, the finalists present their transformational project and our members vote live that evening when the grants are awarded. It's a little different this year. We had a pre-vote to make to ensure that the vote had as much participation and accuracy as possible, um, but we still awarded the, the grants at the annual award celebration. And then we partner with our grant recipients in a fairly long-term uh, relationship of at least one year up to three years while they're getting this transformational project off the ground or, or running. Um, and then I like to end my little segment with what I think makes Impact 100 really, really special. Uh, so first, I already mentioned that 100% of our membership dollars go to the grant pool. So every one of those $500 or $1,000 goes right into the grant pool, which means that uh, we have a 100% volunteer working board. So we have, like I said, we have our wonderful assistant, assistant Jen. Uh, in our outsourced capacity, but other than that, it is completely uh, member-led, the whole process from start to finish. Um, and our members can be as involved or uninvolved as they'd like to be. So it's a choose your own adventure situation where they can just write their check and know that the other members are gonna be great stewards of their, their donation, or you could be president. So runs the gamut of participation. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to our wonderful grant review coordinator, Kathy Thornton. Take it away, Kathy. Thanks so much, Sarah Grace. And I want to add my word of welcome to to all of you. Um, we're trying, <clears throat> excuse me, we're trying something just a little bit different this year, which is what we're all doing, right? Innovation, adaptation, trying new things. So we'll welcome your feedback about how this goes. Um, in the fall, we really focus a lot of our attention on the nonprofit community and how we can assist and how we can inform about our particular process. So we started this particular um, cycle on October 22nd with a joint presentation with Grants Plus on some sort of some ideas and tips uh, for thinking about how to tell your story during this um, time of unprecedented um, change and challenges and so forth. And then last week we did a full session on our LOI session, uh, our LOI application process and if you did not see that, that will have more details than we're going to go over today. So the, um, so we have today's session and then one next week we'll talk about in a moment. So the purpose of today is to do a very brief overview of our letter of intent grant cycle, 
um, and have some frequently asked questions that um, have already been asked. But the major intent is to be, I think, more informal and to have an opportunity to ask questions uh, that you may have. So during this brief overview, feel free to put any questions that you have in the chat function. But at the end of this brief, brief presentation, um, we'll just, we'll take the PowerPoint off and we'll just have a conversation and ask any questions that you um, may have about um, submitting a letter of intent for impact if that is something that works for all of you. So that's kind of the overview of what we hope to do today and um, hope that you'll be able to join in with questions. Um, so as I said, our timeline at this particular point, we're in the October, November, all the information sessions um, following this session next week on November 10th, we do have the nonprofit panel discussion, which will be at um, 9.30 on Tuesday. If you haven't registered for that and want to, um, we certainly invite you to do so. Um, that session is a little bit different. We will have four panelists, three people who have been grant recipients and one who was a finalist, but not a recipient. And we ask them questions about um, their experience, um, their um, how they, how they um, what they learned during the process, what kind of advice that they might have if you're thinking about applying. And um, so it's kind of a real skinny from the applicant perspective. So um, always interesting. Um, I know I always learn something. So that's next Tuesday at um, 9.30 and we will be recording the session as well. Um, so then the other thing to know right at this point is that in December, that's when your letter of intent is, is due. So um, that will be on December 11th at noon, Friday, December 11th at noon. And so that's an important date. The uh, rest of the cycle in January, we begin to review the letters of intent. In March, uh, we review begin to review the full grant recipients. So if you are invited to make a grant, a full grant application, you will be notified toward the very, very end of February or the 1st of March. And then in April and May, we actually do um, site visits to those that we want more information about. And in June, we announce our finalists. And as Sarah Grace said, our awards celebration is in September. So just as a quick overview, our letter of intent has several basic component areas. And if you want to see what these are, um, you can either listen to the um, presentation from last week. There is also a PDF of the LOI basic components on the Impact 100 website at impact100.org under apply for a grant. So the first area is your organizational information. And this would be probably very self-explanatory. Who are you? What's your address? Who's your executive director? Um, who's the LOI contact person? Very basic information. The one thing that um, to remind you of is that in order to apply, you must be a 501c3 or, or um, 509, and you will have to upload your letter indicating that in a PDF form that that is your status as a nonprofit. Uh, we serve 10 counties in one in Indiana, three in Kentucky, and the six counties around um, in Southwest Ohio. So you must have a service, your service must be provided in at least one of those counties. It can be multiple counties. A uh, question came up um, last week about whether the, like the headquarters had to be here. Um, and we have had several applicants where the headquarters was not here, but the service uh, being proposed was in our area and that is, that's okay. Um, you will also select your best fit focus area. Sarah Grace has outlined those five specific areas and you'll need to um, decide which one is the best fit for the application that you are making at this particular time. Uh, there is always overlap in many, many, many cases. And so you just have to decide what you think is the best fit. Re remember that our grant reviewers will be um, reviewing applications that are at least somewhat similar because of the focus area that they're choosing. So health and wellness applications are together, education applications are, get, are together and so forth. Uh, the next area is your proposal summary. And I think for the letter of intent, this is one of the really important areas because this is where your grant reviewers are going to be looking uh, first. What is it you want to do? And why do you wanna do it? What is the need you're doing? So this is a summary area where you're going to just be talking about um, the need, 
why you um, feel that this is an important need and you can do it. And what is it really? What is your compelling idea? Um, if you need more sort of ideas about thinking about uh, drafting a compelling idea, uh, the Grants Plus information gives you some tips about how to think about um, your compelling idea. Uh, the next is an expansion of your proposal summary that's the proposal narrative. And this is where you will put more detail than in the summary. If you think about being a grant reviewer, um, the first area gives an overview and then the narrative gives you an opportunity to tell a little bit, uh, little bit more about it. Um, so it's, a, it's your chance to give a little bit more information, a little bit more data, uh, a little bit more developing your story, so to speak. And then the last section is on your project budget. Uh, your project budget must be $100,000 and you have to talk about what it looks like. So uh, we, we want more detail. We don't want you to simply say, for example, on the example, uh, capital investments, $100,000. We want you to break that down into its component, uh, its component pieces. You can see from the example, um, for example, where it says equipment purchase, grocery carts, and there's a plus minus sign on the other side. So these are just the ways that you can add or subtract lines in your line item budget. Please be sure that um, it adds up to $100,000. Otherwise, um, we'll have to contact you and say it's not, you know, it doesn't total correctly. So we appreciate it if your budget adds up to $100,000 and it does have some detail that um, gives us a sense about what you're, um, what you're hoping to do. So here are just a few of the common questions that um, we have had just to sort of kick off our, um, our question session. So will impact 100 fund operating costs. So we do not fund in the current model, we do not fund current operating costs, but we do fund operating costs associated with projects that may be new or expanding um, or delivered to um, a different um, geographical area or potentially to a new population. Uh, we recognize that in order to um, do new things or expand things, uh, there are operating costs that are associated with it. So in that context, we, um, we do fund operating costs. Uh, second question, may we collaborate with another nonprofit in our application? And the answer is absolutely. If you apply as multiple organizations, we will need Eventually, we'll need the financial information from both. You may also collaborate where one, um, one nonprofit is the lead and some of the services are delivered by um, another nonprofit. So we certainly um, encourage collaboration if that works for your, um, for your particular circumstance. Uh, may we submit more than one application from, um, from our agency? And so the answer to this is no, what we do is we look at the applicant, um, your 503, um, 503 status. And so you may only have one application from that one fiscal, um, from that one fiscal agent. Um, so it's really important, um, especially sometimes in some larger organizations that that all gets kind of coordinated. And may we use the $100,000 grant over multiple years? And the answer is yes. As Sarah Grace indicated, um, most of our grant recipients uh, spend their um, grant dollars between one and three years. So they can either be um, spread out over, the, over at least one year with a maximum of three years. The way that that works is if you are a grant recipient, um, you find that out in September, and then over the next um, six weeks or so, uh, we work to develop a grant um, contract, so to speak, um, of what are the milestones that you um, will meet in order to fulfill your grant, your, your grant application, uh, as well as what is the payout schedule. Um, just kind of a reminder of the long-term nature of these pr proposals. While we will award the 2021 grants in September of 2021, first checks will not be distributed until uh, Giving Tuesday, which is the Tuesday, of course, after um, Thanksgiving. So it's a <clears throat> it's a very very long process. So we you know encourage you to think about that as you think about projects that 
um, may need may need funding. We're looking at long term uh, transformative projects, and it's a it's it's a, it's a long process. So just to remember that. Okay. So what are your questions? And I see there's one question in the chat. Oh, it's just the re it's just the recording. So this is the um, as we referenced last Thursday, um, we uh, spent some time giving a little bit more detail about our letter of intent process. And so this is the link to uh, to that particular um, particular um, recording. So. <laughs> Sorry, Kathy, I was gonna, uh, while people are typing away their questions in the chat, one of the things that we got a lot of questions about at the LOI training last week was um, about the focus areas and where best to choose to submit your grant. Could you maybe talk about best practice there or why they are the way they are? Is that the way they are? Okay, um, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> so, um, so the focus areas, were designed, I think, originally to say, how can grant reviewers best kind of compare in some ways? So the idea was if, if the topics were so different, how do you compare, for example, a, um, an application that is looking at something in the environmental uh, region with something that has to do with um, health and wellness? You know, they're pretty different um, in the kinds of things that they might um, that they might do. So the focus areas are an attempt to say, let's kind of compare um, at least applicants that um, are in the same general area. And I will say as, as um, I led a focus, focus area group for several years, and sometimes you would get um, multiple nonprofits attempting to do kind of the same thing. So that was a way to sort of weigh um, which proposal perhaps in a, in a general topic area might, might have some better chance of um, being a grant recipient, I guess. So the focus areas, again, are an attempt to say, where are you best positioned? Now we recognize that you can have an education project about the environment, or you can have um, a health and wellness um, application that has to do with family. So we recognize that they're not, I mean, some, some applications are pretty distinct and some are not. And so you just have to decide which area you think is the strongest of a potentially overlapping focus. I don't know if that helps. It's, it's a little. Absolutely. <laughs> Helpful. Uh, so Sue has our next question. Can the budget be greater than $100,000? So at this point in time, uh, the budget that Impact 100 would fund can only be $100,000. In January, so um, the Impact 100 membership is go, goes on a calendar year. So by the end of December, we will know how much how many dollars we have to fund our grant pool for 2021. And we announced that um, in January. So sometimes, for example, this year's application pool was over um, 400,000. Um, and we ended up because of the nature of um, this 2020 year, we donated some of our overage to the Rapid Response Fund of the Greater Cincinnati Foundation and United Way. So the grants were $100,000. In previous years, sometimes if we don't have the even amount, they end up being more than $100,000. But at this point in time, your grant budget must be $100,000. Now, if your project costs will cost more than $100,000, if you are invited to do a um, grant proposal, you would simply tell us how you're going to fund the remainder of the project costs should you be an Impact 100 grant recipient. Great, thank you, Kathy. Um, Annie has a question about tone. So would you prefer a more formal tone in the written portions of the LOI or a more personalized, perhaps less formal tone? I don't think I could say that we have them in, in both formats and I don't think um, there is not a requirement one way or the other. I think what helps is for you to find a way to tell your story in a way that is, um, 
meaningful and clear to the grant review committee. One of the tips that I would give you is to remember that um, the women that are reviewing your grant applications may not have the expertise that you have, probably don't have the expertise that you have, um, either with um, your particular nonprofit or with the um, need and the content that you're talking about. So that's really helpful. Um, I know I talked to one, um, one, per, one recipient uh, over the course of the last time and, and she had said, I didn't realize that some of the things that I knew and took for granted with the work that we do every day is not the knowledge that the grant review team had. So in any way that you can make it clear um, what it is you want to do, how you want to do it, and what the need is. So if it, that, that's in a formal way, that's perfectly acceptable. If it's in an informal way, that's perfectly acceptable as well. Great. Um, next question is from Mary. Our agency 2020 financial year ends in May 2021. Should the LOI include the current 2020-2021 agency budget? So your agency budget um, will not be required unless you are a grant applicant. And we recognize that there are uh, many different timelines for, um, for your financial resources. So what we require in when the grant applications come in in March um, is for you to submit what you have for the uh, 2020 year. And then you have the opportunity to update as your information becomes more available. Um, and Carrie is asking if we are able to share how many applications we receive and how, um, how many we receive in each focus area. So um, we receive a lot of applications, um, but we're not able to tell how many in each particular focus area, although we have said that they do tend to mirror um, the percentages of nonprofits in our community and in nationwide. Uh, that work in the various areas of um, popularity, so to speak. So for example, one of the areas that many nonprofits serve are in health and wellness. And so our applications tend to, tend to mirror some of, those, um, some of those larger areas. Great, thank you. And uh, Colleen works within a new nonprofit that's a collaboration between four previous programs um, that worked out of a donated space. And she's asking, um, we can expand our impact if we have a permanent location for all four programs. Can we write the grant to use all the money towards a capital campaign for the warehouse we want to buy? So uh, Impact 100 does um, fund collaborations and they do fund, we do fund uh, capital expenditures. What would, um, I guess what you would need to consider is not money toward a capital campaign, but toward actually um, some kind of space that you already own. Um, it would be important that you already own space not to simply raise money in order to acquire a space. Great, thanks Kathy. Um, is there a specific budget form that they should use for the LOI? Yeah, so the uh, budget form is on the um, LOI application and it was the screenshot that we shared uh, just a bit um, before, which is simply line items for um, each area. You would simply write in the line item that you need for, for your budget, be it uh, supplies or salaries or um, transportation or whatever it might be, and then the amount that you are um, indicating for each line item. So for this particular point, you use the form that's embedded in the LOI application. Can you kind of, um, in, the, in the scope between $100,000, just one line item, to detailing out every last penny, what is really acceptable for the LOI in terms of um, budget detail? So at this point in time, we're looking for, I would say, sort of broad categories. So for example, um, you could have um, supplies. You don't have to say pens and staplers and crayons, but supplies would be a, you know, perhaps a, a category. Um, if you were uh, renovating space, for example, you might have um, things like uh, HVAC or um, 
drywall or you know, I'm not very expert at some of those kinds of things. But again, we're looking for, you know, broad categories um, at this particular time. If you were to um, do a budget in a full grant application, we would look for a little bit more detail. Um, so somewhere between $100,000 and Sarah Grace's um, thing about details for every single one. So basically, we really want to just know that you have you scope the project and understand what what the resources are needed. Exactly. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Kim has a question. If we are looking to expand our program to help more people, can we propose our collective programs or will we need to only focus on one program? Hmm. Um, what we're looking for is um, a specific population that you are serving or a specific project that is um, dedicated to multiple, um, multiple audiences. So if you can, if you could, I guess I'm t really talking off the top of my head here without knowing the details. I would say that if you um, can make a case that you're um, expanding your program um, probably to a certain target, I'm guessing, I'm not sure. Um, it, it's, 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 it's certainly possible uh, and you would have to think about how, um, how to craft that so that it has, you know, we're looking for sort of some boundaries so that we can identify what it is you're doing and how you're doing it. And that we know that our monies are being invested in a way that we can kind of know what, where they're going and how, how they're having an impact. So Kim followed up and says she, they have, they work with low income single mothers. So that is their demographic. So that would be a demographic. And if, you know, instead of having, I could envision where you could have multiple kinds of things that would support single moms that um, could be, certainly could be a possibility. Um, in the past, Impact 100 has not told organizations why the request was denied. It would be very helpful to have at least a list of reasons for rejection so we would know what to focus on in, for future requests. That is always the, not to make a pun, but the $100,000 question, right? Um, one of the things that um, is a guiding principle in Impact 100 is we pledge, and we have to sign off on this, that all of us pledge not to be coaches. And in my life, I have been a grant reader, a grant writer, a grant recipient, and I know how frustrating it is to know when you don't get funded. So it's really, um, it's really challenging. And in Impact 100, not only do our grant pool applications change every year, <clears throat> our review committees change every year and have different people that are associated with them. And so, there can certainly be times when requests one year might be a recipient and another year they might not be. So um, we do not give specific feedback. Um, we have created, and um, I'll reference it in a minute, but um, something called a viability checklist. And this is available on our, our website as well. And we encourage you to use this as a checklist for sending in your letter of intent application. It's some common reasons that letters of intent are rejected um, for failure to have certain kind of um, pieces of information and those sorts of things. But I think the question probably at the heart of the question is, you know, why did we not move forward? Um, and can you give us some feedback for improvement? And the answer around that particular content answer is, we don't give that kind of feedback. I wish, you know, there's part of me as a recipient, I wish we could, but um, we really work hard to keep a level playing field so that um, all of our grant applicants and all of our, um, throughout the process have sort of an equal chance and nobody's getting any extra, extra information. Thank you. Um, and I just linked the viability checklist, checklist in the chat. Um, and it, it, is, it is very detailed and vague all at the same time <laughs> because that's kind of how this process is. Um, and, and, uh, but we do try our best with, with this to give as much feedback as we can without coaching. Um, Colleen has a follow-up question. So going back to the question about capital for a warehouse, 
would Impact 100 fund rent for a period of time until we're able to get the capital to buy a warehouse? Um, I would generally say probably no, um, because again, um, we're looking at a certain kind of um, stability, I guess. Um, and knowing that um, it's, it's a facility that that's, you don't own, I would say we probably would not fund rent. Mm -hmm. Sarah Grace, do you have a different opinion? I, I think it would have to be what is the intent of rent. So, you know, if it's just to, again, operating expenses, if it's just to maintain your current operating, that would be something that our, our membership would, on the viability checklist, say, no, this is clearly um, just maintaining current operations. If it's something that you're testing out to uh, go to market in a different way or a new program, I think it has to all be tied to something that isn't, um, I would say it could be a viable option if it's tied to something that is not just a, a current reality, if that makes any sense, if that gain, adds any clarity. <laughs> so I'm sorry to chime in here. Yeah, it would actually be able to give us space so that we can actually start generating our own revenue. Because right now we can't do that because we don't have a place to bring in the things that we would be charging fees for. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so that would be an expansion. I mean, I, I think if it's all about, well, I don't want to coach. I, I, can see how that, <laughs> I can see how that could be expansion. Um, and sustainability is part of the LOI, or maybe it's not part of the LOI, maybe it's a part, I think it's part of the LOI, but I know it's part of the grant application that we focus on is how does this, how is how are these funds and this transformation gonna be sustained? Um, so yeah, great. Thank you, Colleen. Um, Annie, or no, I missed Michelle. Michelle said, can we speak generally to how the impact of COVID-19 may impact an organization's ability to work directly with clients? Is it possible to direct some grant funds to adapt to new health safety requirements when working with clients? Yeah, so this was, this uh, kind of question was very much a part of the uh, Grants Plus training uh, from October 22nd, which is, you know, the COVID-19 stuff has affected obviously everyone and affected um, the way that you as nonprofits work and who you serve and how you serve them and so forth. And so the reality is telling your story from, um, you know, based on the current context and to some degree uncertainty. So in terms of, you um, your story, that is certainly a part of where we are now and uh, certainly could have some possibilities. Um, as well as uh, when you think about grant funds to adapt to new health and safety requirements when working with clients, I think that will again depend on what it is you're doing with clients and um, how that affects your um, idea for doing a transformational impactful project. Um, over the, you know, over a certain period of time. So, you know, if it's only to fund new health procedures, that in itself, uh, I would lean towards saying probably not, but if it's an integral part of delivering your service in a new way to a new group or something along that line, I think it's a possibility. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Annie asks, would, uh, would you like to see photos or testimonials from previous projects to support the LOI? Or would you come uh, at a future, portion of, or would that come in a future portion of the application process? Right. So for um, the letter of intent process, um, we do not ask for nor want um, photos or testimonials or any of those kinds of things, um, nor do we do it in the actual grant um, process. Where it does come into play is if you are, um, if you receive a site visit and hopefully next year we can do site visits in person, fingers crossed, right? Um, uh, at that particular point in time, those are the opportunities to, um, you know, tell more of your story using those kinds of those kinds of tools. And then, Kathy, I have a quick question from the Grants Plus training. We talk a lot about how we're living in this new normal with COVID, and one of the part participants, and I don't know if I, I can't, I don't even know if I got their name, was asking, should that really apply, thinking through COVID and how it's impacted things? with a grant cycle that's so long. And I would like, it would be great if you could kind of summarize the conversation around that in the Grants Plus training. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the Grants Plus training fo focused on a couple of different things. It focused on creating a compelling idea and how, how, that, um, how you might think about that. It also talked about how you can tell your story um, and, 
how you can use your client um, voices perhaps in telling, uh, telling your story. And they also talked about how can you use data more effectively um, in helping to tell your story. So clearly COVID-19 has impacted everyone's work and those kinds of things. Um, but again, knowing whatever your own particular context is and what kinds of um, projects might in, might in fact still be possible as you think, think ahead. We recognize and honestly, we're, we'll have to see how all the stories come out or how the grant applications come out. Um, honestly, we were surprised in 2020, if you go back to the timeline, LOIs came out in December of 2019 for projects way before anybody knew we were gonna have a pandemic. Um, and so as we got into the grant phase starting in March, we weren't sure how many people would even be able to move forward with those. Um, and we're very surprised, honestly, um, at the vast, vast, vast majority um, were able to look ahead and see how these projects would be able to uh, continue. And we were able to award four um, outstanding nonprofits with $100,000 grants in September. So even from our um, grants process, we're still looking at unknown. So to answer how this, we kind of don't know. And I don't, you know, I feel like those are things we have said over and over again during this pandemic. I don't know, we'll have to see. <laughs> so I think those are, um, it's whatever way that you can think about it in your context for your nonprofit. Um, and certainly we expect there to be information that has COVID related implications. And Kathy, that wraps up all of the questions I have in the chat, so. Does anybody want to unmute and ask a question? So I was wondering um, about the, so I think there's, if there's five impact areas and only four awards, so not every impact area will get a, an awardee, um, but do you try to have one awardee from each of those areas or are there some years where you'll have three from one area just because they were just really good projects and then fewer from other areas. Correct. So in our current model, um, each focus area gets um, one finalist. So that is sort of like the, um, um, the main idea. This year we had um, quite a number of finalists and that really had to do with um, how, I'm trying to think, we had so many good projects that our committees um, really had a very hard time deciding on one from each area. And we really wrestled with how many to have because again, not everyone could be a recipient. Um, and our hope was that even for the non-recipients um, that there was be some opportunity to gain greater um, awareness of needs, uh, greater um, potentially um, support because more people know about what's going on and that sort of thing. So in um, so the basic year would be a minimum of five, uh, depending on how many awards we have to offer. And so we have had everywhere from five finalists to this year's, we had eight finalists. We usually have more around six, but it's gonna depend. You know, we are anticipating the possibility that we may have uh, less funding this year, just as all of you with your issues have um, contribution issues and fundraising issues. So Colleen, you are attached to your focus area until finalists. So okay. once they're announced as finalists, focus areas go away. Okay. Um, and then we vote as all finalists together, not based on focus area. Okay. That's how that works. Thanks. No problem. And then Kim, I saw that you were unmuting as well. Yes, hi. I was wondering about the, you talk about the site visits. We have a, a space that we share with SCORE. Now we, we do mentoring for single, low income single moms and we help them to overcome poverty and become self-sufficient. So to, to um, get off the government systems and things like that. Um, so we don't, we, we have a space, but it's not um, one that we own. How much of an emphasis of owning your space is there? I just have heard it mentioned a couple times. Mm -hmm. 
I think the only, the issue with owning is when you're looking to, um, I remember what, for example, if you were wanting to renovate space, mm -hmm. but didn't own it, that would be, oh, okay. That would be a question. If you're, if just you're living in it uh -huh. and it doesn't really have anything to do with what your project request is, then it's, it's no problem. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone, anyone else want to unmute and ask a question? This might sound like a really strange question. Um, what if your LOI um, uh, is affected by the election between, you know, um, I would specifically work with incarcerated individuals. Um, and so things could pivot based on um, the election outcomes. And so I'm just curious, I, you know, I know you guys understand that from the LOI to being invited to potentially submit a grant application, there's a, there's a time difference there. Um, I don't know how deeply we, or what my idea would be uh, affected by it, but just when you see, do we, when you see things having to pivot, like with COVID, I mean, and when, I mean, so you could even use that even just like an example, like you said, I mean, um, how, 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 how is that, how would that, I'm not sure what the exact question is, but how would you be able to react to that in terms of, you know, if it pivoted a little bit from LOI to grant and would that change your invitation to grant? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not totally sure of the question or totally sure of the answer, but this is my sense. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So here's my sense. So the LOI is due uh, December 11th at noon. So hopefully we'll know the current election <laughs> before then. But um, so you have that particular time. And if you were invited to do a full grant application, if you think about the LOI, it's kind of a, um, an outline um, and you know, not, not a full sense. So we certainly have had LOIs that have been invited for a full grant that have had some changes between the LOI and the grant application. And um, we've even had it between grant application and site visit. Um, I would not say like total change of idea or anything like that, but certainly maybe some budgetary differences or um, uh, an audience you might be serving slightly differently. So that's certainly still, um, that's certainly still possible. So I think does that make any sense? <laughs> and I would, oh, sorry, go on Tracy. Oh, no, I was going to say, no, thank you. You did um, clarify that for me because it wouldn't change um, the population we serve. Um, it, it could potentially change the way in which we serve it. We're working on different multimedia aspects of uh, reaching that population. And so it'll be based on the person who comes into position and what they allow us to pilot. So, cause this would be yep. for a new program. So, yeah. so I, I apologize for being yeah. well, less and, articulate. Well, and the, um, you know, obviously the COVID things, we had a lot of um, pivots. Uh, we had a, a 2019 recipient, for example, and Sarah Grace had referenced, um, you know, sometimes we work with a nonprofit recipient for a year, sometimes three years. Um, so stuff happens. <laughs> so we, we work really hard to be good partners and, um, you know, kind of a, you know, what makes sense and those kind of things. And so our, one of our 2019 recipients who was going to be doing on-site services at schools. Mm -hmm. So definitely big pivot. <laughs> and I would, I would just add on to Kathy, the partnership piece is we are partners with our nonprofit um, recipients or from the beginning, from LOI through. So communication with us is key. Um, you know, we're not to play on stereotypes, but we're 541 women. We love to communicate, right? Um, and so I would say that. And then I would also say in terms of pivots and shifts, you know, the rate of change is moving faster and faster. And if we really, if we kind of look at like Simon Sinek's golden circle, it's the why. Like if your why and your outcomes are staying consistent, that's what we want to know. That's what we want to make sure. So the how you're going to do it, that can shift and we can support, support you in that. I have a question. 
is it is it okay to um, resubmit uh, a project idea? Uh, we we uh, submitted an LOI last year, uh, got through to the to the application stage, but we're um, denied at that stage. Mm -hmm. Our um, our need for that project still exists. If anything, it's been uh, intensified with um, ramifications from COVID. Is it okay to just resubmit? You know, tweak it a little bit, and as it as it looks now, and resubmit. I love easy. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. We've had grant recipients uh, that have submitted three or four times. You, you know, like they've 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 learned and and kept going. And um, so yes, we very much are open to resubmission. We okay. like. Thank you. Uh, I have a question from Nate down here. To Colleen, Colleen's point, if real estate creates specific opportunity, is capital funding less fitting than other types of projects? Impact 100 has funded all kinds of capital projects, all kinds of project projects, program projects. Um, so there is not a specific preference um, again, going back to the original question, I don't think we would be looked at, we would not be looking to fund a capital campaign, um, but certainly have funded many capital projects. And I just posted a list, our CR Impact. So every grantee is on our website under CR Impact. So you can look, there is a wide range. So that'll give you some ideas to what's been funded in the past. Mm -hmm. Okay, any last questions? Okay, Kathy, you want me to throw the PowerPoint back up to wrap up? Real quick, just to wrap us up. Yep. <clears throat> okay, some um, other resources. Um, there are frequently asked questions on the Impact 100 uh, website. There are also um, all of our training resources, all of our recordings, all the stuff from Grants Plus. Um, when you go to the website and go to apply for a grant, you'll see all of these resources. Um, and uh, Sarah Grace had already put up a copy of the viability checklist. So all of those things are there for you to look at when, um, you know, when you have the opportunity um, to be able to do so. So the viability checklist has a whole lot of things. I just selected a couple of them. Um, I won't read, take your time and read through them, but you'll see these are some of the reasons um, why some LOIs might be rejected. And again, we just recommend that you use this as a checklist to make sure that you have your 501c3 or 509a certificate letter, for example, that you've chosen a focus area, um, that funds will be utilized within three years and not, um, funds or projects that are already completed, those kinds of things. So use it as a checklist. It's just another tool that um, can be useful. Uh, finally, again, when it comes time to um, apply, you can do it in a couple of different ways is, as far as developing your application. Many people recommend doing it offline and then cutting and pasting, but you may start um, by going to the Impact 100 website going to apply for grants in the apply application process. And there is a, I think, pretty um, visible um, place for you to click on the application. You do not have to do it all at one time. You have the ability to start your application and you don't have to do it in one sitting and you can simply click on save and continue. You'll be asked to enter your email address and you'll get a link to go back to the application uh, until you are actually ready, um, that, until you are actually ready uh, to submit your application. So again, this seems to be working great. So um, we really encourage you to um, start as soon as you have your idea and your thoughts and not wait till the absolute deadline, even though we know that's what usually happens, but we really encourage you to do it, not right at the deadline in case something goes wrong. <laughs> And one of the tips that Kathy mentioned in our LOI training last week was to save your own record just in case you lose the link or something goes wrong. Copy and pasting into a Word document is never a bad idea so that you're not having, you don't lose all of your work just in case. Just in case. 
And just to add to that, once you do submit um, your letter of intent, uh, you will get you know a confirmation which includes your letter of intent. So, um, you know, try to have a lot of backup systems, right? <laughs> Especially right now in this world. <laughs> so just to remind you, your letter of intent is due Friday, December 11th at noon. Um, we will uh, accept your most recently submitted one. So we have had situations where someone submits one and then says, oh, I need to submit you know, changes. So you have to actually resubmit. You can't make changes once it is actually submitted, but you can submit um, a new one, so to speak. So again, important deadline. We really encourage you not to wait till 11.59 on December 11th because we do look at the timestamps. Um, so really encourage you to uh, do it sooner than that. So just to remind you, letter of intent, December 11th, in January, we'll announce our membership dollars. Um, in late February, early March, you'll be notified if you are invited to submit a full grant application and full grants are due um, on March the 19th. So you just sort of have those um, dates in kind of mind. Uh, we'll have some kind of a grant application training session. Right now it's projected to be March the 4th. So moving on, so again, um, Wanted to remind you of the nonprofit panel presentation on Tuesday at 9.30. Again, register at impact100.org slash events to hear the, um, the real, real world uh, explanation from uh, some of our most recent recipients. Yeah, and if you have any um, questions that we have skirted because we cannot coach or you want more dirt on, <laughs> uh, great time to, to come because the nonprofit recipients are not, they, they, they can not, say whatever they want. They can do whatever they want. Exactly. We don't coach them about what to say. <laughs> exactly. So, it, and it's one of my favorite events just to mm -hmm. hear from our recipients. So, so I have one quick, I have one quick question for you. Um, I have been contacted by the public library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County about the resources they have for, um, searching for grants and grant writing. Um, are most of you familiar with those? Yes. Good, okay. Thank you. So again, we're always interested in um, sharing the Impact 100 story and um, we invite you to um, share information with your nonprofit um, friends and those kinds of things. Um, if you know of someone or can be a sponsor or you yourself or your friends might be interested in joining for 2021. Um, we're more than, um, more than welcoming to all of those kind of things. Um, Sarah Grace told you that all of our member donated dollars go to the grant pool. So one of our challenges as a nonprofit is how do we support our operating costs for um, everything from our website to our audit and all the things that you all know go into sustaining an organization. So. Um, we do have a 110% membership where um, members donate 10% more in order to help sustain us. So um, anything that you can do to help spread our word um, for um, our grant pool, for our nonprofit support, or for our membership, um, we encourage you to do so. So we're really grateful that you were here with us today, and um, hopefully this was um, helpful to you. And um, any feedback that you can give on, on format, um, as we said, we haven't done it this way, but um, would appreciate your feedback. So thanks for, thanks for being here today and um, hope everybody can get outside. It's gonna be a beautiful day. <laughs> thanks, thanks so much. Thank you. Have a great day.